Hi there! Today we're going to talk about instant cold packs and hot packs. A lot of videos you see online explain this by saying, well, it's a two-part mixture of a salt and water that you mix together and it gets either hot or cold. Yeah, but why? Uh, well, you see, when you add the salt to the water, one is an endothermic process, so it gets cold, and the other one is an exothermic process, so it, it gets hot? Yeah, but why? Well, you're not going to get any of that weak-ass stuff here at PhD at Living, because we give you the straight dope. Let's go. Generically speaking, you can think of an instant hot pack or cold pack as a packet with salt and a vial of water. You crack the vial of water, mix it in with the rest of the salt, and depending what the salt is, the solution either gets hot or cold. You can use non-salt materials such as urea and non-aqueous solvents such as acetone or methanol, but that's not important right now. What is important is that because we have a salt and water, there are three big interactions that we look at that determine the thermal effect of that solution. First, we have solute-solute interactions, that is, things that happen between the pieces of our salt structure. For this one, we're going to talk about ammonium nitrate, one of the principal components of cold packs. Here we have the ammonium polyatomic cation structure, positively charged ion, and the nitrate NO3 anion, negatively charged structure. And these two pieces come together just like opposite ends of a magnet, plus and minus, they attract. These pieces of this AN molecule will coordinate with other pieces of different AN molecules and form a crystal lattice. That is, an ordered repetitive arrangement of these ions that forms a greater macromolecular larger structure. That process, when the ions all come together and form that crystal lattice, is exothermic, meaning it gives off heat. Which brings up an interesting point. Lattice energy is an exothermic quantity, meaning the sign is negative. However, in a lot of places you'll see the lattice energy described as a positive number suggesting endothermicity. Well, there are a number of explanations for this, but the most plausible one that I've heard, and my personal favorite, is the chemists were just incredibly annoyed that they had to write a whole pile of negative numbers for lattice energies in tables and textbooks and CRCs, etc. So the convention was changed to make it a positive quantity for nothing other than convenience. Breaking that ionic structure in a process of, I don't know, let's just say dissolving our AN in water requires energy. It is endothermic. That is to say, pulling each of these ions away from their counterparts because they are attracted to them naturally takes a decent amount of energy. So that's the first interaction, the endothermic decoupling of these ion particles to dissolve them in the solvent. Next, we have solvent-solvent interactions. These are things happening between our water molecules. Water is interesting because in that greater H2O structure, the oxygen not only retains two lone pairs of electrons, creating a lot of negative charge density over this way, but because of the electronegativity difference of the atoms, different video, we have partial positive charges on the hydrogens and a partial negative charge on this oxygen. This creates something known as hydrogen bonding, where in the next water molecule, the hydrogens from that second one really want to kind of coordinate over here with the lone pairs and that partial negative density of that oxygen. So this, it's a non-covalent bond, it's just sort of an association between the charges. Again, this hydrogen is positively charged, partially, and the oxygen is negatively charged. We get this coordination here, and as far as intermolecular interactions go, this one's pretty darn strong. So, much like breaking our crystal lattice of our solute salt particles, it takes energy to break up these hydrogen bonds between the solvent water molecules. Boy, that's a lot of words, isn't it? Finally, as I'm sure you could have guessed, we have solute-solvent interactions. When we break the crystal lattice of those solute particles, it requires energy. In addition, when we break that hydrogen bonding network of the solvent, it also requires energy. However, when we make new solute-solvent bonds, when we're, for instance, dissolving our salt in our solvent, we create energy so it is released. Yeah, sure, energy is neither created nor destroyed. I misspoke. Sue me. As you can see here on the nitrate anion piece of that AN, we have a positively charged nitrogen atom in the center 
two very negatively charged oxygens on the outside and this oxygen which retains a little bit of negative charge density. If we think about those water molecules, because the hydrogens have partial positive charges, those H2s are going to very much want to coordinate with the negatively charged oxygens over here and the oxygen much rather would associate with the positively charged nitrogen here. Again, when this whole interaction happens, energy is released. It is an exothermic process. So those are our three reactions, three interactions that we have to look at when determining whether a salt dissolving is going to be endothermic or exothermic. Solute-solute, solvent-solvent, and solute-solvent interactions. Cool? Once you have the quantities, figuring out the final number, the enthalpy of solution, what we're really looking for, is a pretty simple addition subtraction. Remember from before that our lattice energy is a positive number, because the way we look at it is to break that crystal lattice structure requires energy. Interestingly, the other two pieces, the solvent-solvent interactions, the water molecules being broken of their hydrogen bonds, and the solute-solvent interactions, that salt dissolving in the water, are lumped together in a new quantity called the enthalpy or heat of hydration. As we said, the lattice energy is always positive, while the heat of hydration is always negative. So, it becomes a very simple addition there. Subtract the heat of hydration from the lattice energy and you get the enthalpy of solution. If your enthalpy of solution is positive, meaning the lattice energy magnitude is larger than the magnitude of the heat of hydration, you get an endothermic process, so ammonium nitrate higher lattice energy than the heat of hydration. On the flip side, with something like calcium chloride, the lattice energy is not very large, so the heat of hydration is much larger, which means the enthalpy of solution will be negative, meaning hot pack. The tricky part here is nobody really knows what the exact quantities of these things are. You can get pretty close experimentally, but if you look online and in textbooks, the numbers vary wildly. The other goofy part, and one of the big reasons for making this video, was the predictive capability of these salts. Can I take something like sodium chloride and compare its lattice energy to potassium chloride, or rubidium chloride, or cesium iodide, or lithium fluoride? Well, it turns out yes, but only to an extent. Here you can see a table of all the lattice energies of the alkali halides. I borrowed this table from a University of Purdue chemistry website and I'll put the link in the notes. You can see that from lithium fluoride at the top left to cesium iodide at the bottom right, the lattice energies decrease. So with increasing ionic radius, the cesium plus ion is bigger than the lithium plus ion, and the iodide minus ion is bigger than the fluoride minus ion, increasing ionic radius, the lattice energy decreases. Now while this trend is very easy to see, none of these lattice energies has any correlation to the heat of hydration of any one of these ionic compounds and therefore enthalpy of solution. So just from looking at the lattice energies, there really isn't a good way to tell whether potassium chloride is going to be exothermic or sodium bromide is going to be endothermic. This trend also holds for increasing ionic charge. So for a given anion, the sodium compound will have a lower lattice energy than the magnesium compound, which is 2 plus, and that in turn will have a lower lattice energy than the aluminum 3 plus compound. Again, this doesn't really have any correlation to the heat of hydration or the enthalpy of solution, so your guess is as good as mine as to what the lattice energy or heat of hydration is actually going to give you as far as whether a material is endothermic or exothermic when it dissolves in water. And that's the chemistry behind hot packs and cold packs. You put ammonium nitrate or urea in water and it gets cold. You put calcium chloride in water and it gets hot. Now that all the science is gone, it's not really all that interesting just hearing what compounds do it though, huh? Next time we're going to talk about a different set of reactions that gives us different kinds of hot packs. But that's for then and this is for now. See you later! I had coffee with Macaulay a half hour ago!